to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night you will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but it is not rich towards God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than the clothes. Consider the ravens, they do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them, and how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you not. Even Solomon, in all his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. That is the word of the Lord. pray that you would speak to each one of us in our hearts. You will guide our thoughts and help us to be your people, working together to bring the kingdom of God to this world and to this parish. Lord, I ask that you guide what I say to help your people learn what you want them to know. We heard in our reading today the parable of the rich fool and about not worrying. And we've sung a lot about the gifts that God gives us. In this parable, no, sorry, Jesus, as we uh, heard last week, had been teaching his disciples about praying the Lord's Prayer. After that, he'd gone out and been challenged by a number of the Pharisees about points of law. As they were trying to trap him, you could say it was a favourite pastime of theirs. During this, he was interrupted by someone in the crowd, asking him to intervene in a family dispute about inheritance. Now, a rabbi, now for a rabbi, this was not an uncommon experience. As they were expected to interpret the law, 
and arbitrate in such disputes. And if you look at Deuteronomy 21.17, it sets out the way an inheritance should be shared. It provides that a double portion of the inheritance is for the firstborn. Therefore, if there are two sons and the elder receives two-thirds and the younger one-third, if there are three sons, the elder receives two-fourths and the other two each receive a fourth or a quarter. So it was quite clearly set out how the inheritance was to be spread. This interruption, however, was not about asking for arbitration like a Pharisee would um, a rabbi would normally be asked. It was about, it was asked in Jesus to take one side against the other, to take one brother's claim against the other. And Jesus declines to do this. He recognizes that it's not about the amount that is inherited but rather that the father has left the inheritance to the two sons jointly. And this man doesn't want joint ownership. He wants to be independent of his brother. He wants to be able to do his own thing, to get on and spend the money how he wants to, rather than for the good of the overall family. The brother seeks to use Jesus' authority as a recognised rabbi to gain power over his brother in the dispute. Hence, Jesus' response is quite abrupt. Man, who appointed me to be judge or arbiter between you? Jesus' reply echoes the language of Exodus chapter 2 and verse 14 where Moses tried to stop the fight between two Hebrews. You may remember it. One of them asked Moses who, are you, who made you prince and judge over us? Jesus could mean that he does not have the authority to arbitrate in this dispute but he is more likely questioning the man's right to involve him in the dispute. This man's self-interest clashes sharply with the context in which he makes a request. Jesus has been teaching the people by the thousands. He warned them of pharisaical hypocrisy. He told them not to fear those who kill the body. But, cast, but those who cast them into hell. He encouraged them to confess the Son of Man before the people. He told them that they, were, they will face opposition and, be assure, and assured them that the Holy Spirit will give them the right words when they were dragged before the authorities. All this we read in the section just before our reading. And amid all these serious concerns, the man interjects with a request for help with his inheritance. In doing so, he's revealing that he has not been listening. He is only concerned about his personal problem. His interjection is trivial by comparison to what the teaching was that he was interrupting. So it is inappropriate and disruptive. Jesus goes on to say, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in abundance of possessions. Jesus sees to the heart and he addresses his reply not just to the man, but to the whole crowd. 
he uses this opportunity to teach about the danger of greed. The man who brought the grievance has focused his eyes closely on possessions so that he sees nothing else. Jesus calls him to pull back so that the whole world, whole life, whole of life comes into view, an exercise that puts possessions into perspective. Possessions are still in the picture, but look a lot smaller when seen against the backdrop of the rest of life. Jesus turns the discussion from the man's inheritance to his real need. Defence against greed and an opportunity to become rich towards God. These points Jesus has made in various ways throughout the Gospel of Luke. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. We've sung that today. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits his own self? Therefore, I tell you, don't be anxious for your life, what you eat, nor yet for your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, the body is more than clothing. Look at the power of the rich man and of Lazarus's life. How hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? Luke chapter 18 and verse 24. Jesus has been teaching about living and coming and being respectful to God. Jesus then goes on to tell the parable of the rich fool, which was read to us. The man was rich having such good harvest. We are not told if he was rich before, if he had lots of money, but it would appear that he was reasonably well off. He had his own barns to store at least some of the harvest and we can therefore assume that he was well off. The harvest is better than his expectation and exceeds the investment that he has put in in planting and harvesting. A harvest that is truly the gift of God. we must ask ourselves what responsibility do we occur, incur when we acquire a lot more than we need. Sometimes it does happen. When we see this man in verses 17 to 19, he talked about no one but himself and decided to keep it all to himself. He certainly did not ask for God's guidance. Is that what we would do? If you look at this, it is all centred on the little words, I and my. Verse 17. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to score my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I shall store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink and be merry. So there is no thought for anybody but himself. He gives no thought of a bonus to his hired hands or to servicing a project for the community. 
he offers no word of thanksgiving to God for his tremendous harvest. Everything he says is I and my. He has more than enough to meet his needs. More even than he needs to live in luxury. His future could, be not, could not be more secure. Now he has to do, all he has to do is enjoy his wealth. That is his plan. However, as we see, his plan soon goes awry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then you will get what you have prepared for yourself. And who will get what you have kept? People who love possessions tend to guard them very jealously. They maintain tight controls, erect barriers to prevent other people from gaining access. The thought of squandering someone squandering their wealth will be very painful to them indeed. However, when rich people die, their plans begin to fail. Wills and philanthropic foundations provide only the barest protection. Fortunes are often spent in ways the founder never envisioned and never would have approved of. And eventually moth and rust corrupt even the most prized possessions. When we ignore God and do our own thing and put what we want before what we before God then we run the risk of being treated like that fool in the story therefore we need to be on our guard each one of us God has given us everything that we have and we need to offer something back to God for his use in helping others we each have skills, we each have jobs and trades, we have money and we have possessions. Are we willing to share these with God for whom growing the kingdom is the priority? Or do we want to keep them for our own private use? As we often say in the offertory prayer, of your own do we give you. We give part of God. We give God part of what he has given to us. Luke says in verse 21, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God i.e. they will die and they will lose everything. They are not Jesus' words but Luke's own comment on what will happen to those who only think of themselves and put themselves first. Compare this story with the rest of our reading where Jesus teaches his disciples about worry God cares for those who bring themselves before him and worship him. I will just counsel you on not taking God's love for granted. There are many verses in the Bible, and in particular in the Gospels, which we like to quote. One author described them as the fifth Gospel or the gospel according to St. Evangelicals. If we look at the reading today, for example, the gospel according to St. Evangelical, 
would not include the parable of the rich fool because it was about dying. But what it would do is include the second part about going and not worrying about what God will give because he will give everything that we need. There is another reading at the, go at the closing of St. Matthew's Gospel where it says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Again, the first part of that tends to be left out of the gospel of St. Evangelical and we just concentrate on the words I, and surely I am with you always to the end of the age. God gives us commands as well as promises within the gospel and we need to actually do undertake those commands to receive his blessings. We must do something to be for God to be and that will be another talk. We are given many gifts and riches of all kinds by God but we need to thank him for them and share them with those who are in need. Amen.